MacArthur with Jackson Canada in their Toronto office. He has a uh, broad ranging political litigation and advocacy practice in such areas as class action defense, securities, auditors, and negligence litigation. It's uh, an oxymoron, actually. <laughs> They're always wrongfully accused, but uh, they, we had to come up with some little buzzwords, so that's what we call it. Uh, banking and insolvency, shareholders' disputes, and professional negligence. Norm Moonlight's playing electrical guitar and slide guitar in two blues rock bands in Toronto and Montreal. Indie Jammin' and Exiled on the Main. They play numerous fundraising concerts throughout the year for charitable organizations, such as the March of Dimes of Canada, the Canadian Organization, CIBC's Run for the Cure, and Peace Builders International. Norm is a former director of the Advocate Society, and he continues to sit on the Audit, co audit Committee and Premises and Arts Committee. <coughs> Thanks for that introduction. So uh, we actually grew up in Mount Royal, and uh, we never paid attention to our French teachers in high school, and we both hail from the city of Toronto, also known as the city of the 1967 Stanley Cup champions. <laughs> <laughs> so mindful of the hour, I'm going to let all of the speakers self-introduce. That's a new word that I'm going to use. But we are going to start with uh, Marie-Anne Sauvé, who has the uh, best punctuation of any of the last names here on the panel. She's got the, is it the umlaut, the um, double dots, uh, like, like the yoga commercial? We have to pronounce it. Anais. Anais. Okay. <laughs> It used to be a perfume, Anais, it Anais, is. I remember it that. It is. And then an accent aigu or accent grave, it's certainly not circonflex. Accent aigu. Okay, so <laughs> she's to my immediate left. Uh, and then we're going to hear from Gord Kaiser in the middle, who's going to talk uh, right off topic about this animal called uh, class arbitrations, amongst other things, largely because when I attended last year in Toronto, I thought it was a fascinating topic. And then about three months ago, I thought, yeah, what was it that he was talking about again? So we said, let's surface it again. And then finally, we'll hear from Bob Luer, who hails from <coughs> Saskatchewan, who I discovered um, by surfing the web earlier, has a photograph, and this is a di quite a daring photograph. He's there with a big grin on his face underneath four Canadian geese. And anybody who lives near any bodies of water will know about the uh, economic or the environmental uh, footprint that Canadian geese leave on this planet. So uh, salute to you <laughs> there, Bob. Uh, Marie is going to introduce herself, and then she's going to speak about, bring out the glasses, settlement conferences in Quebec, private mediation in Quebec, class proceedings fund, and the impact of the new civil code of procedure in Quebec, all in French. So if you don't understand French, you can don the uh, state-of-the-art headsets that are hardly noticeable or you can um, pay attention and, and think that, you know, you should have... Try to understand. <laughs> yeah, okay, go ahead. <laughs> Bonjour, alors, uh, je m'appelle Marie-Anaise Sauvé, je suis associée du bureau Sylvestre Raffard Pinchot, on est un spécialisant recours collectif depuis uh, plus de 25 ans, alors uh, on, a, on travaille dans... On est rendu à plus de 100 recours collectifs où on agit en demande, alors on est toujours uh, représentant de groupes de, de citoyens ou de consommateurs. Euh, je suis associée du bureau depuis 2010 et euh, j'ai participé récemment euh, à une conférence de règlement à l'amiable dans le cadre d'un recours collectif où on avait 19 défendeurs et où on a eu deux règlements distincts, dont un avec 15 défendeurs. Euh, donc, passer en conférence de règlement à l'amiable avec 15 défendeurs, ça fait beaucoup de monde autour de la table, mais j'ai beaucoup appris et euh, je voulais partager un petit peu euh, cette expérience-là avec vous, pas précisément sur mon dossier, mais sur ce qui entoure euh, le, le processus de, de règlement des différents euh, en matière de recours collectif. Alors, si vous êtes assis ici, vous devez vous connaître un petit peu en recours collectif. Alors, juste brièvement, alors, euh, quand on est en recours collectif, on représente une personne ou un organisme qui représente un ensemble de personnes qui subit euh, généralement le même préjudice. Alors, on appelle cet ensemble-là les membres. Et euh, en matière de recours collectif, on a une première euh, étape euh, initiale qui est l'autorisation. Tant qu'on n'a pas franchi l'autorisation, on plaide pour autrui. En fait, on n'a pas encore l'autorisation la, 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 de la Cour euh, de faire nos représentations pour représenter ce groupe-là. Alors, 
pourquoi je vous dis ça, ça va avoir un impact un peu plus tard dans ma, dans ma présentation, quand on va parler justement de l'impact du nouveau code sur les recours collectifs. Alors, l'état de l'autorisation avait été un petit peu euh, déformé au fil des ans, avait été complexifié. On a deux décisions de l'année dernière en, à la Cour suprême qui est venue remettre les pendules à l'heure et euh, en fait remettre au niveau de simplicité ce que l'état de l'autorisation doit être. Alors, essentiellement, c'est qu'on veut filtrer à l'étape d'autorisation les recours euh, qui seraient frivoles. Alors, on a quatre critères à remplir à l'autorisation et si on les remplit, alors là, on passe au vrai recours collectif avec euh, les preuves d'experts, les témoins, etc. Au Québec, euh, dès qu'on dépose une requête en autorisation, on se fait nommer un juge. Et c'est ce juge-là qui va nous suivre tout au long du processus. Si on se rend, et c'est maintenant que je posais la question, quels sont les modes alternatifs qui sont utilisés en recours collectif et pourquoi, et alternativement euh, également comment on les utilise. Euh, essentiellement, en recours collectif, ce qui est tout, utilisé au Québec, c'est la conférence de règlement à l'amiable. C'est un service qui est gratuit, qui est offert par la Cour supérieure. C'est la Cour supérieure qui s'occupe euh, de la section recours collectif. Alors, euh, on doit formuler une demande, remplir un formulaire qu'on envoie au juge en chef qui nous nomme un autre juge, parce que le premier juge qui nous a été attitré ne doit pas être mis en conflit, étant donné que vous savez bien qu'il y a des règles de confidentialité quand on va en processus de règlement des différents et le juge ne pourrait pas être mis dans cette position -là. Alors, un nouveau juge nous est attitré. Et ce juge-là a un rôle de facilitateur. Euh, il y a une nouvelle équipe de juges qui a été euh, nommée à la Cour supérieure de Montréal, euh, spécialisée en recours collectif. Alors ça, c'est nouveau, c'est le juge Roland qui euh, nous a appris ça il y a quelques mois. Et euh, ce groupe de juges-là, spécialisés en recours collectif, ont comme nouvelle directive, et ça va en parallèle avec le nouveau Code, euh, doivent forcer ou vont ou devraient forcer euh, les parties à aller en, en conférence de règlement à l'amiable dès le début du processus. Semble-t-il qu'on va se faire fortement inciter à, une à, à, à procéder à une rencontre, euh, rencontre d'information et de discussion sur euh, ce qui est une, une conférence de règlement à l'amiable. En recours collectif, le taux de réussite des conférences de règlement à l'amiable quand on se rend là est de 68 alors, c'est assez important comme, euh, comme taux de réussite. Et euh, le moment pour le demander, alors il n'y a pas vraiment de bon moment, ça peut être autant avant l'autorisation qu'après. Souvent, les défendeurs vont s'essayer, étant donné que l'autorisation est un processus qui est quand même assez rapide en général. Souvent, les, les défendeurs vont préférer aller en conférence de règlement à l'amiable après que le recours soit autorisé. Alors, tout dépend du dossier, mais il n'y a rien qui exclut euh, qu'une conférence de règlement à l'amiable soit, euh, soit débutée là, avant, avant l'autorisation. Pour maximiser les chances de réussite, euh, ben, c'est un peu comme dans n'importe quel euh, processus de règlement. Euh, il faut bien connaître le dossier, bien évidemment, et il faut être capable de justifier nos calculs, parce qu'on parle en général en recours collectif de gros montants. Et si on veut faire euh, digérer ça euh, par la partie adverse, il faut avoir des bons arguments et des calculs sérieux. Et si on en vient à une entente euh, au cours de la conférence de règlement à l'amiable, l'entente doit être approuvée par le juge qui nous a été attitré au début du euh, dépôt de la requête en autorisation. Donc, on ne on fait, fait pas juste crier euh, « victoire ». Quand on a signé une entente suite à une conférence de règlement à l'amiable, ensuite, il faut la faire autoriser, en fait, approuver par notre juge. On a des critères à remplir. Je ne vais pas vous faire un cours de droit sur ces critères-là. Il y en a plusieurs. Mais essentiellement, ce qu'il faut faire, c'est qu'il faut convaincre le juge que notre entente, elle est bonne, en fait, pour l'intérêt des membres. Donc, le juge doit toujours garder en tête, est-ce que cette entente-là est un bon règlement pour l'ensemble des membres qu'il doit protéger, parce que le juge en recours collectif a cette, euh, ce rôle-là, peut-être supplémentaire, de devoir protéger l'intérêt des membres. Alors, euh, c'est sûr qu'en conférence de règlement à l'amiable, ce qui est intéressant, c'est qu'on peut être un peu plus inventif. 
on peut avoir recours à des mesures ré ré réparatrices, on peut, euh, dans le cadre de règlement, faire des dons à des organismes de charité ou autres, dépendamment du cas. On peut euh, utiliser une certaine somme qui serait versée par les, par les, déf par les défendeurs pardon, pour, par exemple, créer une chaire de recherche dans un sujet en particulier. Je donne un exemple en matière de droit de la consommation. Euh, ben, Peut-être que la partie adverse ne serait pas intéressée à... À, 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 à dédommager les membres directement, ou peut-être que c'est difficile dans certaines circonstances, et préférerait euh, donner ces sommes-là, comme je disais tout à l'heure, soit un organisme de charité ou euh, créer des chars, des chars de recherche spécifiquement sur le sujet qui serait visé, par exemple, sur le recours collectif. Alors, ça nous permet une possibilité de, de, de varier, pas juste obtenir notre 50 par membre, comme on, on demande initialement au recours. Euh, et euh, ça permet également d'avoir, euh, en fait, de, ça, ça, ça nous permet également d'indemniser le requérant. Euh, avec le nouveau code, c'est quelque chose qui va être permis, mais actuellement, ce n'est pas permis de, que, que le requérant reçoive une indemnité particulière pour son travail. À mon sens, c'est un, un, bon, un très bon amendement, en fait, euh, de, que d'accepter de, que de, de, d'indemniser le requérant parce que, il doit en mettre de l'énergie, euh, il doit mettre du temps. Euh, dans les recours collectifs, souvent, on est confronté aux plus gros bureaux d'avocats, d'avocats chevronnés, avec des interrogatoires qui sont étouffants. Alors, euh, faire, vi faire vivre tout ça à notre requérant, on est bien content, au bout du compte, de pouvoir lui donner, euh, qu'il puisse bénéficier d'une indemnité. Alors, actuellement, qu'il puisse avoir une indemnité, c'est pratiquement seulement possible euh, quand on a euh, une entente euh, à l'amiable. Mais comme je le disais plus tôt, ça va être possible avec le prochain code. Euh, donc, euh, comme je le disais tout à l'heure, après avoir eu l'entente, on doit procéder à une audition. Alors, on est vraiment les deux parties devant le juge et on doit plaider que notre entente rencontre les critères. Et c'est possible que le juge dise non. Le ou la juge dise non. Et là, il ben, faut, euh, faut, faut, faut réagir vite puis voir euh, même à ajuster certaines parties de l'entente. Le juge a également un rôle de déterminer le contenu des avis. Parce que quand on règle un recours collectif, euh, oui, on avise notre requérant. Notre requérant, oui, ça peut être une personne physique, ça peut être un organisme, comme par exemple Option Consommateur, qui a peut-être un petit peu de visibilité plus qu'un qu requérant lui-même. Mais on doit s'assurer que le, le, le règlement du recours soit connu du plus de monde possible. Dans le cadre du recours collectif dont je vous parlais tout à l'heure, où on avait 19 défendeurs, dans euh, le, le, la, le, le règlement qu'on a réglé en CRA, on a utilisé euh, YouTube pour euh, faire des publicités, pour faire connaître euh, le règlement. À ce moment-là, c'était dans le cadre d'un recours collectif pour la crise du verglas en 1998 et on voulait envoyer des chèques à des gens. Depuis 1998, vous comprendrez que beaucoup de monde peut avoir déménagé, être décédé. Euh, mais s'ils étaient décédés, leur succession pouvait être bénéficiaire de, du chèque qu'on voulait envoyer. Donc, on a voulu faire une grosse campagne pour que le plus de membres possible puissent recevoir leur chèque, pour les aviser de nous informer. Ben, en fait, pas nous personnellement, mon bureau, mais il y avait un gestionnaire, d'aviser le gestionnaire de leur changement d'adresse. Alors, YouTube a été un excellent moyen. Euh, dans le passé, on utilisait beaucoup euh, les journaux. C'est un peu dépassé. Les journaux ne rejoignent plus autant de monde. Peut-être la population plus âgée a, a encore beaucoup recours aux, aux journaux papier, mais on utilise de moins en moins. Alors, le juge, suite à l'entente à, à la conférence de règlement à l'amiable, va donc également devoir déterminer le contenu de la vie et de quelle façon on le publie. Alors là, il va falloir avoir les représentations de chaque partie. Une autre euh, avenue qui est possible, mais qui est beaucoup moins utilisée, ça va être la médiation. Euh, pourquoi moins utilisée euh, que partout, j'imagine, dans le reste du Canada, dans le ROC, comme on appelle? Euh, ben, premièrement, parce que c'est cher. La conférence de règlement à l'amiable étant gratuite, euh, c'est une considération que, que, que les deux parties doivent avoir, mais j'ai envie de dire principalement les avocats en demande, parce que vous savez qu'on n'est pas payé. On n'a pas d'honoraire tant qu'on n'a pas gagné le recours. Alors, on est payé à pourcentage si on perd, c'est zéro. Alors, si en plus, on a déboursé des sommes pour se payer un médiateur, vous comprendrez que là, on, on, on s'étrangle de plus en plus. Et euh, en général, 
on a une réponse assez rapide des juges. Euh, on se fait attribuer en conférence de règlement à l'amiable un juge assez rapidement parce que le juge en chef voit euh, que ses statistiques pourraient être euh, <rire> grandement améliorées si on réglait un recours collectif qui pourrait éventuellement euh, utiliser des ressources judiciaires pendant un mois, deux mois, trois mois. Les recours collectifs peuvent être très, très longs. Alors, si on peut en régler un à l'amiable, euh, le juge en chef aime bien ça. Alors, euh, on a donc au niveau de la médiation privée, euh, bon, je disais c'est cher. Par contre, étant donné que c'est cher, si on y a recours, c'est qu'on veut euh, réduire les délais au maximum puis qu'on a une réelle, réelle intention de régler, à mon avis. Si on est prêt à chaque partie à débourser des sommes et à ne pas vouloir attendre euh, la conférence de règlement à l'amiable, euh, ça dénote cette volonté-là. L'avantage également en médiation, c'est qu'on a le choix de notre médiateur. Comme vous le savez, ce qui n'est pas le cas, euh, ni, au, au, euh, ni par rapport au juge qu'on se fait attitrer au début du recours collectif, ni celui qu'on se fait attitrer en conférence de règlement à l'amiable. On se le fait imposer, puis vous le savez, il y a des juges qui sont très, très bons dans certains domaines, ils le sont moins dans d'autres. Alors, la médiation peut être pertinente dans des cas très complexes, par exemple, si euh, euh, des cas de fraude financière ou quelque chose comme ça, ça, ça pourrait valoir la peine de, de vouloir euh, déverser des sommes pour ça. Maintenant, comment pourrait-on financer euh, ces modes alternatifs de règlement-là? Euh, pour Au Québec, on a le Fonds d'aide au recours collectif. C'est un organisme qui relève du ministère de la Justice et qui est soumis aux mêmes règles que les ministères, tous les autres ministères et organismes. Et il y a pour fonction euh, d'apporter de l'aide financière aux personnes qui désirent intenter un recours collectif et qui n'auraient pas les ressources nécessaires pour le faire. Alors, quand je disais tout à l'heure qu'on n'était pas payé, les avocats en demande tant qu'on n'avait pas eu gain de cause, euh, c'était, en fait, il y, y a une petite exception à ça, c'est qu'on peut avoir une partie de financement par le Fonds d'aide au recours collectif, mais on doit déposer une demande, on doit convaincre les administrateurs. Il y a beaucoup de, il y, y, y a de plus en plus de délais euh, pour obtenir euh, une audition, parce qu'on doit plaider devant le conseil d'administration. Alors, on doit présenter la demande avant, de faire la conférence de règlement à l'amiable, parce que si on la fait après, ils vont nous dire, bien, trop tard, on n'est pas un organisme de, de subvention, on doit analyser avant que vous, entame, que vous engagez les sommes. Alors, euh, et il faut débattre, par exemple, on pourrait se faire poser la question si euh, on voulait avoir des sommes pour aller en médiation privée, ce qui est possible, euh, mais on pourrait se faire, qu on, se faire poser la question, oui, mais pourquoi pas aller en CRA? Alors là, il faudra avoir une bonne réponse à fournir aux administrateurs. Puis là, chaque dossier est, est différent et euh, ça dépendrait à ce moment-là euh, du dossier. Euh, mais ça n'empêche pas que le fonds d'aide peut quand même nous attribuer certaines sommes. Quand on fait des demandes d'aide, on doit indiquer toutes les heures qu'on veut, euh, qu'on qu évalue devoir faire pour euh, le dossier. Et il nous donne un faible pourcentage, j'ai envie de dire peut-être 5 des honoraires qu'on aurait euh, généralement. Euh, quand on fait les, les, les calculs, grosso modo, à la fin, quand on voit combien d'heures on a mis au dossier puis combien d'heures on, on a été payé. D'ailleurs, on est payé, quand on a 10 ans et plus d'expérience, on est payé 100 de l'heure par le, par le fonds d'aide et il coupe nos heures minimalement de 4. Si je dis que je vais avoir 400 heures dans ce recours-là, c'est sûr qu'il ne m'en paye pas plus que 100. Alors, euh, si on va aller en conférence de règlement à l'amiable, on peut faire une demande pour obtenir un certain financement pour les heures qu'on veut consacrer à la conférence de règlement à l'amiable, puis pour la médiation, on pourrait en plus demander des frais pour payer le médiateur. Je termine avec le dernier point, euh, l'impact du nouveau Code civil sur euh, le processus, les processus, de, les modes de, euh, alternatifs de règlement. Il euh, y, y a plusieurs modifications, en fait quelques-unes, euh, mais qui n'ont euh, qui, qui pas attrait nécessairement au mode alternatif de, de règlement, alors je n'en parlerai pas. Mais ce sur quoi je me questionne, et ce matin, j'ai pris la peine d'aller à une conférence directement sur le sujet euh, de l'obligation de considérer les modes alternatifs de règlement. Et je me questionne encore aujourd'hui, je n'ai pas eu la réponse, il y a beaucoup de flou encore, euh, mais comment peut-on appliquer cette obligation de considérer les règlements alternatifs, les, les modes de, alternatifs de règlement, pardon dans un contexte où, en recours collectif, comme je vous disais plus tôt, on plaide pour autrui au départ. Alors, comment pourrais-je, avant l'autorisation, 
tenter d'approcher la partie adverse pour tenter de négocier un dossier alors que je n'ai même pas le droit encore de, de, de représenter les membres du groupe. Alors, au, au niveau du recours collectif, moi, ça me pose une, une, en fait, une question, genre de voir comment on va nous, nous encadrer là-dedans. Est-ce que l'obligation va venir peut-être plus tard après l'autorisation ou est-ce qu'ils vont euh, exiger qu'on fasse quand même certaines démarches? Mais j'ai quand même un certain malaise à, à ben justement, à plaider au nom d'autrui. C'est sûr que mon requérant ou ma personne désignée peut aller voir l'entreprise et dire ben, « moi, j'ai tel problème, dédommagez-moi ». Ils vont lui donner 150 dollars, mais vont-ils donner 150 dollars à tous les autres membres qui sont dans la même situation? Alors, euh, c'est le point qui m'agace un peu avec euh, le, le nouveau code. Euh, sinon, il y a quelques autres modifications, mais qui ne sont pas en lien, comme je disais un peu plus tôt, avec euh, les modes alternatifs de règlement. Et là, je vais passer le micro à mes confrères. Merci. Ça fait plaisir. <rire> I'm going to uh, turn the tables over now to Gord Kaiser, and uh, I noticed that uh, the panel members at least have a beautiful presentation. I'm not sure whether that made it into the CD-ROM. Uh, if it hasn't, we can certainly get it to you. And uh, hot off the press and included in this is something I think Gord's going to touch upon, and that is the OSC's settlement approval of uh, a settlement in the Sino-Forest related matter. But The topic that we're dealing with, or the topic that uh, drew the vast numbers into this room, <laughs> the use of ADR in class actions, many of you may be mediators, arbitrators, wondering how to sort of get in, get in on the wave. And we, uh, rest assured, we will get to that. Um, and one observation I'll make, and I've heard it from class counsel, uh, class action counsel on the defense side, as well as plaintiff side, although more on the plaintiff side, um, is that Now in Canada, more and more cases are getting certified. The courts are a bit more comfortable with certifying cases. So I think there's more of a movement at the front end of the case about thinking about how do we get rid of this case? Uh, what kind of mechanisms are we going to develop to deal with the individual claims, either on a settlement basis or if we lose a common issue trial? And that's the stuff of, of mediations and arbitrations and whatever other term you might use. Uh, but over to Gord. Gord's going to talk uh, about class proceedings, uh, the roles of neutrals, both south of the border here, class arbitration, and then I think um, uh, the last topic, which is uh, very interesting, is this uh, settlement agreements and regulatory proceedings where they bump up against class actions. So, Gordy. Well, as Norm said, I, I did uh, prepare a paper. I I don't know what a CD-ROM is, so it's just a piece of paper, but there are copies up, up front. Um, I am going to talk about arbitration and mediation and class actions, and if I have time, also in regulatory proceedings. And the reason is, as, as uh, a lot of us who try and make a living full-time engaging in arbitration always are very interested in figuring out what's coming down the line. Where's the business? And I have a bit of an unusual perspective on this because I spent 13 years in the glorious state of California. And uh, I wasn't practicing law. I was running a telecommunication company owned by Nokia in uh, Newport Beach, which is uh, as close to heaven as you can get. <laughs> There are only two reasons why people don't live in California. They've never heard about it or they can't. And, uh, <laughs> Uh, but I did learn something about arbitration because uh, if you practice any kind of business in the United States, particularly the state of California, you know one sure thing in life, on the Monday mail, you will have at least two lawsuits. And on Tuesday, they will go to your lawyer, and on Wednesday, they will go to the insurance company. And uh, that will feed uh, all kinds of people for the next five years, uh, including arbitrators. Now, of course, class actions are more developed in the United States and Canada. We're a little bit late to the game, uh, but we're not too slow. And as Norm has suggested, we're finding out and our courts are finding out. And these juicy class actions, the one where there's lots of business for lots of people, fall into uh, traditionally into securities and antitrust or competition law, as we call it in Canada, and more uh, recently, in the environmental area. And they tend to have lots of defendants. Brian heard me say this in Calgary last week. 
If you look at Lac Megantic, there's nine categories of defendants. You've got the oil guys that produced the oil, uh, the two train companies that carried the oil. You've got the manufacturers, the tank cars, the lessors, the tank cars. You've got the refinery, poor Irving over in St. John. You've got the owners of the crude. You've got the regulator who they say was negligent. You've got the Canadian government who they say was negligent because they didn't supervise the regulator. Now, it won't surprise you that most of these cases settle uh, for different reasons, but it turns out neither side wants to go to trial, and I'll explain that, <coughs> particularly in the United States, but to the same degree in Canada. Now, in the United States, and there's some detailed material in, in this material, it is an industry. The arbitrators and mediators are involved in every step. Uh, it starts, as Norm said, with the certification. They get involved in that. Then they get involved in discovery motions because Americans love to produce documents. And because of all these defendants, you need documents. All you want to do is find out who owes you how much. This is all about settlement. The certification is the real trial. And so you want to know, okay, Brian, you, you're, you're good for so much because I now know what exactly you did in this convoluted process after this damn train left Montreal and went to Megantic. I know exactly what your role was, and here's what I figure you owe us, uh, minus, of course, the 30% for the class action lawyers. Uh, the Americans have, have managed to follow it through. Um, I have a view as to why that is. Um, they get involved in the liability of the settlement, they get involved in, in, in the quantum of damages, and they even get involved in post-judgment administration. Um, that's a, my own view as to why that's happening, and I think it's starting to happen, and you know, I, I make this observation just as how this industry is developing. I'm associated with the JAMS organization. When that grew, uh, started 40 years ago, started in California, Irvine, California, where I live, um, judges weren't paid as much as Canadian judges. Uh, they could hardly wait to grab their measly pension and go across the street and become a mediator or arbitrator because their brother judge would send it across the street because he was too busy because the courts were broken. And so it was a pipeline. And they could hardly wait to, and when I went to the first jams organization of the sort of the newbies in Washington, D.C., I couldn't believe these guys that they were recruiting. I said to my wife, this is the New York Yankees. There's a the chief judge of the Northern District of California. I mean, that's God. But of course, they couldn't wait to walk across the street and earn three times as much money as they were the week, week before. Uh, nothing wrong with that, of course. Uh, so what are the Canadians doing? Uh, well, they've actually started to pick up on this. I noticed my old association, which was Nissan's, they kicked out those of us that weren't judges and they rebranded themselves the bench or something or Mikas or whatever. But anyway, they've developed a pipeline and what are they doing? They're doing case management. And where are they doing that case management in particular? In class actions, where it's big stuff. It's complicated. And it turns out none of these damn judges want to do case management. So the retired judges are saying, let me help you. And so they do this work and they, and they rule on motions for discovery and how much discovery, et cetera, et cetera. And they write a report to the court and that's the start, I believe, and hope uh, that there'll be a growing practice of arbitration and mediation in class actions. I hope they will pick up from their American cousins and, uh, and move it along. Now, why is this uh, a greater role, a reduced role in Canada? Well, there are a couple of differences and, and it will never be as big in this country as in the United States. The first thing is the Americans develop this MDL where they consolidate these cases. So if you have a case, if you've got a price fixing case in California, in Michigan, New York, you consolidate them. What do we do? There'll be a price fixing case in Quebec and BC and Ontario. You can bet the same case, the same dependents, different plaintiffs, right? They will not get consolidated because the view is that the provinces don't have the constitutional right to consolidate <coughs> cases and for whatever reason, the constitutional reasons, principally the federal government has not. So when they get consolidated in the United States, the sitting judge says, I need help. And they'll pick two mediators. And they did in this credit card case. And the two mediators worked two years to finally sort that mess out. But the court didn't. The arbitrators did. 
And of course, the Americans perhaps arguably have a greater focus on document production. Maybe that's true. But one thing that is, is true is that corporations hate punitive damage in juries, which they get in the United States and generally you don't get here, so they like settlements. And in the antitrust case, there's treble damages, as Andrew would know. We don't have that here. And the corporations hate treble damages. Hate juries, hate treble damages. Settlements has a stronger attraction in the United States and Canada. And the plaintiff lawyers like settlements because they don't like the expense of a trial. So there it is, a marriage made in heaven and uh, some arbitrators make some money in the process. Um, I want to talk about another area briefly because it's a growing area and, and many of you wouldn't be familiar with it. I'm more familiar because I've lived in that world so long and that's uh, the increased use of arbitration and mediation in regulatory processes. Now most tribunals have a, have a procedure for approving uh, settlements. Uh, Norm was referring to a particular settlement to which I'll come to. Some even have specific rules for um, relating to mediation, the Ontario Energy Board, the BC Utilities Commission, the Ontario Independent Electricity System Operator just expanded its uh, panel of both arbitrators and mediators, doubled the uh, amount of money they're paying them, put some new people on it. The rules that relate to those procedures go 50 pages. Mind you, as nice as it looks, they've never had a case, but they're getting there. Um, some tribunals have standing panels uh, with mediators. Some have standing panels with uh, arbitrators, as I've said, I referred to the ISO. That's old stuff in the United States. The Federal Power Commission started in 1949, 1977. The Federal Energy Regulatory Commission took it over. It's a wholesale business. Um, so it's growing. And it's growing for obvious reasons. These tribunals are bogged down. But there's some very interesting issues that I think people in this room, if they have an interest either as counsel or mediator or as arbitrator of getting in on this growing business, should realize this is not uh, your garden variety settlement agreement. Uh, first of all, these settlement agreements have to be approved. And when you're getting approved before a regulatory commission, there's much greater oversight than there is in a court, although it depends on the commission. I'm going to come to this uh, Ernst & Young sino forced case uh, in a minute. But first of all, third parties can oppose. They can come in. Uh, sometimes the tribunals won't let them in, but they can come in, and they do come in, and they can upset the apple cart. Um, you have this issue about whether you have to admit liability. Now, this was a live case in the situation that uh, Norm was talking about. And you go back to uh, Citibank, and Citibank in um, uh, 2011 entered into, they were one of the real bad boys, of course, in this mortgage-backed uh, uh, securities uh, fraud, I guess you could call it that. And uh, finally, the SEC clamped down on them, and they said, okay, you've got to disgorge $60 million in profits, and you've got to pay a $95 million penalty. Citibank said, yes, sir, we'll be happy to do that, provided we don't have to admit any liability. Now, the reason they don't like to admit liability in these regulatory pleadings is the class actions will be on their back within 15 minutes of it being filed. So that's usually a crucial part of the deal. Until they ran into Judge Radoff in the court down there in Southern District of New York, and he said, I'm not going to accept this settlement agreement if you guys don't admit some liability. And uh, <coughs> it became a live issue even in Ontario, in the Ontario Security Commission. They had a, heard all these consultations, and of course certain people hated it and certain people loved it as to whether there could be settlement agreements without admission of liability. Anyway, poor Judge Radoff got reversed by the Court of Appeal in 2014, in June of 2014, and uh, two months later, uh, the Ontario Securities Commission accepted this plea, this deal with Ernst & Young, uh, who wouldn't admit, but uh, it was suggested, uh, had not done their auditing pro uh, function properly, and it resulted there'd been this huge fraud, and they had to cough up eight million bucks, two million of which went to the commission for their trouble and time and chasing them down. So that's uh, still an issue that's floating around. Um, remedies and restitution, um, there's always a question of whether you can get uh, restitution these things. Frankly, what happens, and I've seen a number of these things, and I've been involved in competition cases where one was involved uh, 
price fixing with John Deere little green tractors and we said to the other guys, you know, uh, you're gonna have to refund these people and uh, we think they overpaid by 10% and there was X number of these people and that comes to two million bucks. And they said, uh, John Deere said, well, you can't do that. There's no authority in the act. And I said, well, if you want the deal, that's the deal. Otherwise, we're gonna go after your executives. Well, that took them 15 minutes and they said, uh, where do we send the check? So you can get around it to some degree, but there will be some tribunals when they look at it. In this case, it was the federal court approving it and they didn't give a damn, but sometimes the regulatory tribunals tend to be a little bit stricter. Um, the other thing you get, which troubles some people, not other people, are what I call pork barrel settlements. And you'll say, well, what's a pork barrel settlement? And the tribunals uh, worry about this a bit. Sometimes these settling parties will agree to anything just to get the damn settlement through. And in, in one case uh, that I, I was actually sitting on the Ontario Energy Board, uh, I said, uh, well, why would you agree to take this expense out of your expenses? It was an expense for a, a new uh, a GIS system. You, you said that 80% of your equipment's out of date, you're gonna have to be replacing it. And they said, well, we had to give them something. So I said, well, why didn't you just give them a new BMW? I mean, this doesn't make any sense. Well, they went back and recalculated and so on. So that is a, a bit of an issue. Another issue that's come up, all of these agreements are confidential. Uh, now, they go on the public record. I'll, and I'll talk about this a, a bit uh, in the settlement process that, that Norm is so fond of. Um, there was always a question, the Alberta Securities Commission had a question, can we approve these things in confidence? Because that's what the companies wanted. They not only didn't want to admit liability, they didn't want anyone seeing the damn settlement agreement. And the Alberta Utilities Commission said, no, no, we, we can't do that. Um, uh, it, but, the, but the agreement has to go on the public record at some point and be approved, this is, you know. And the Ontario Securities Commission struggled with that, so they came up with a very interesting thing. They said, okay, we'll have a pre-settlement conference where a member of the board, the commission, will be there and everything will be confidence and we'll give you a nod. Okay, I think I can recommend this. And the member of the commission who's on that pre-settlement conference, <coughs> he does get to sit in a public hearing, which as you might guess takes place like 24 hours later, so there's lots of notice. Um, and then there is a public hearing approving it and the agreement does go on the public record and, and Norm has the agreement uh, there. So. But this confidentiality during the settlement process itself is strictly observed for, for reasons that you can appreciate. The other thing that's kind of interesting is the commissions have approved what's called an all or nothing, which might strike you uh, as being strange coming from a regulatory commission. But the parties, which are usually a public utility on the one hand and various customer groups on the other, stipulate to the board, whatever board it is, you have to accept this thing all or nothing, i.e. you can't cherry pick. And you might think that would fetter a regulatory discussion, but the boards have approved it and it's in the rules of both the BC board and the Ontario board, that is the rule. So you can actually um, get around that. One of the problems with the confidentiality of the settlement discussions was some people, when there was a breakdown of the interpretation of the settlement agreement, as sometimes happens, wanted to go back to the process. And unless there's language in there that clearly says the board can do that for that purpose, you can't do it. So that's something to remember. Uh, the other piece is uh, can you appeal it or reconsider it? Some boards will allow you to reconsider it if there's new evidence. Some are silent on it. It doesn't really matter because if a settlement agreement gets approved, it becomes a board order, a public board order. And uh, bo most boards can review their own decisions. And in most cases, it's if there's new evidence that wasn't known or couldn't have been known, all the usual language. So there is a form of reconsideration uh, that exists. Uh, I could go on and deal with various other issues, but I think I'm gonna turn it over to my friend. Thank before you. Before, thanks, Gord. Um, the uh, Sino case, uh, Looks like it came out at the end of September. There was a case relating to uh, Livent that came out in <coughs> August, which was written up uh, fairly 
extensively by Janet McFarland and the Globe, and it was one of the first sort of no contest uh, settlements uh, entertained by the OSC involving one of the former directing minds of Livant. And I actually had a discussion with uh, one of staff counsel not involved in that case, but about this new OSC policy generally, because to that point in time, OSC cases that had been started years before would just sort of sit on the books in limbo while there's some civil litigation or criminal proceedings taking place. Um, and uh, there was a position paper, I guess, tabled in 2011, and invited a bunch of commentary. And now the OSC, other than in cases where there's extreme egregious conduct, in which case they'll never entertain a no contest settlement, have determined that it's expedient to bless settlements where there is no clear admission of wrongdoing. So what you'll see in these agreements is, you know, whereas a notice of hearing was issued on such and such a date, and whereas a statement of allegations was issued on such and such a date, and then in two or three pages of whereas, involving sometimes a criminal proceeding, charges being laid, and then the last whereas before the operative terms are, and whereas the OSC recast its statement of allegation into an amended statement of allegations, which largely truncates the initial one just to say, we started a proceeding against this respondent, that respondent was charged, found guilty, and on the basis of that, we think that this person or persons or company has breached the securities law. And then this, you don't, you kind of hunt around where are they falling on the sword and they don't. And it just, you know, this case will settle on the basis that so-and-so will never sit as a director or officer of any reporting issuer in perpetuity or for 15 years, in some cases, meted out against people in their late 60s, early 70s, that never had any intention to sit on any uh, reporting issuer's board going forward. And that is a, an OSC victory, and it's really nothing uh, for the person who is basically settling it because they haven't admitted wrongdoing. So it's all sort of out there in the name of expediency, but I did uh, at least get a, a, a not, I guess, a candid, maybe what lawyers would call an excited utterance at a staff council, we would never, ever uh, bless, or the OSC would never bless a settlement if there was egregious conduct on a no contest basis. So with that, uh, we're going to lead into the next topic. Bob wants to talk about the Herniac, Herniac decision. The one thing I meant to mention in introducing Bob, in the first line of his bio, is he's one, and this is true, is one of the most experienced class action lawyers in Canada, period. If you hold that up and print it out to the black light, you'll see a little asterisk for which he thanks Tony Merchant, <laughs> who, uh, as, as Gord said on the Wednesday, you report to the insurer. Well, Bob, I'm sure, has been trolling for emails all day from his colleagues to see what mail has come in from Mr. Merchant. So with that, over to Bob. Yeah, I was actually going to say, if you really wanted an introduction, I had only two things to say. One is I'm from that place that's easy to draw and hard to say. And um, I have a class actions practice that consists of defending claims that have been brought by the Merchant Law Group. I, I am highly mindful that I'm the last thing standing between this group and the bar. And contrary to the scuttlebutt in the hallway, I've got a high degree of confidence that Denton will come through with the name tags, with the promised uh, tickets be, be behind them. So I'm going to do very, very little to, to, um, to interfere with um, our, our, our libations. Um, I, I do feel like I'm here as a bit of a, a fraud. I am a true civil litigator and, and claim to know very little about ADR. Uh, Norm insisted that we'd be up here uh, fielding some softball questions and engaged in a lively round table with active participation by, by the crowd. Um, I'm not sure we can hold up our end of that bargain, so I'm, I'm not gonna hold you up to that either. And at the end of the day, my real job, I'm gonna try to lob two things back um, to the panel. One is to Norm and, and one is to Gordon. I, I'll say these two words to preface that, which again, I'll try to end there. Uh, Norm is the author of probably Canada's most successful um, preemptive ADR, uh, ADR to preempt class proceedings, uh, highly innovative procedure that he invoked to avoid class proceedings 
against a client by by manufacturing an ADR process and av avoiding what is um, to the defendant cynics I uh, easy route to certification in Canada and you really do need to hear a little bit about that story before we break by the end of the day and, and the second softball at the end of what little I have to say I want to throw back to Gordon um, uh, and you'll see why I'm going to do that in just a second the title of this this session was use of ADR in class actions and historical uh, uh, perspective I wasn't sure what the end in the title here really meant um, if and historical perspective m means anything in a in a fast-moving context it might make reference to um, some decisions out of the Supreme Court of Canada in 2007 and 2011 before I talk about that I, I, I'm a little bit interested if you don't mind how many people in this 20 odd group of us um, consider themselves class action civil litigators because it might influence okay so we've got we've got a, we've got a, f a few people here for for those who who are not um, and for those two or three of us or four of us that are um, this this is really old hat in 2007 and then again in 2008 the Supreme Court of Canada in a trilogy of decisions um, effectively concluded and this is a nod to the sanctity of arbitration proceedings that that um, defendants can avoid class proceedings by inserting arbitration provisions in common contracts so um, it was a nod to our, to a voluntary um, alternative dispute resolution processes um, and uh, in a series of consumer contracts con cases and concluded that that um, that um, class actions can in Canada be preempted by by arbitration or clauses that require that matters go to arbitration the great irony in all of this of course is that and I act for defendants so I think I, I've got the platform to say this is that most defendants at least haven't inserted those kinds of provisions and contracts with a real and genuine desire to actually arbitrate disputes they've inserted them with a view to trying to actually oust any adjudication of the issue itself now those provisions um, those kinds of provisions have have in effect been uh, reversed in some provinces including in Ontario by legislative amendments um, but it's an important segue to the ball that I want to throw back at Gordon before we conclude this panel to talk about US jurisprudence that's actually picked up the ball on that and concluded that there is such a creature as um, as um, class arbitration so you're going to want to hear from Gordon about that before we end the thing that I want to talk about though at least briefly is uh, use of, of arbitration and other alternative dispute resolution processes in the context of class proceedings in a Canadian sense uh, just for general context again and I apologize for trotting on on ground that many but not all might know here um, it, it, when we we talk about a class action what we're really talking about is a bifurcated procedure that involves resolution of disputes that are common that is uh, consistent across across the class and then individual so the class proceeding um, as it's commonly thought of resolves the issues that are common across the class but there remains um, individual issues that very often have to be determined in order to conclude to finally conclude issues of liability and to take a couple really easy examples let's say you've got a pharmaceutical product and the allegation is that the product shouldn't have been marketed um, it, it will be a common issue whether or not the manufacturer distributor should have put that product into the chain of commerce um, was the product I'll use colloquial expressions uh, defective uh, was it improper to market or improper to market without a, a warning that will be consistent across all of the class typically ingesters of the of the pharmaceutical product in that case but then there will be individual issues um, was the person actually hurt through the to, again to be simple about it hurt from the ingestion of the product it, it's uh, in, in light of the Canadian jurisprudence there is at least right now very little ambit or room for alternative dispute resolution processes in the first stage of, of that bifurcated procedure except to the extent that the parties might want to engage in 
voluntary um, mediated um, alternative dispute resolution processes. However, it's incumbent in a class proceeding for a plaintiff to design and the court to conclude that in order for an action to be certified as a class action, there has to be a process for resolving the individual issues. And historically, uh, uh, defendants have resisted certification on the basis that there is no effective way to, d to resolve the individual issues, e even if the common issues are def decided in favor of the defendants. Notwithstanding that, there's been, you know, the, the courts have ebbed and flowed about in terms of how easily and frequently um, they will allow class certification. Courts in Canada certify reasonably liberally um, common issues. Um, and it's left then after the conclusion of the common issues, either through a trial or a resolution, to come up with a process to resolve those individual issues. It, there is embedded in the class uh, proceedings legislation that's common across all of the, all of the provinces, uh, jurisdiction to, to drag into the process um, ADR to resolve those individual issues and very frequently as part of litigation plans that plaintiff's lawyers bring forward to courts as part of the certification process, what you'll see is that they're proposing to the court that at the conclusion of the common issues, there will be either a, um, a process, uh, uh, they'll have a contemplated process without defining what it is um, for the use of ADR to resolve the individual issues. And B, in light of the Hereniac decision, which I'll now turn my mind to, I think there's going to be ambit for the courts to begin to at least think about the imposition of ADR in the context of, of the legislative scheme. So at the risk of driving too deeply down the rabbit hole, let me back up from a discussion about ADR and just for a minute talk about civil litigation. Um, um, civil litigation uh, procedures. Um, in Ontario, um, coming out of Ontario um, um, over the last three years, there's been quite a controversy over the use of summary judgment uh, in a true litigated sense uh, for resolution of uh, disputes as opposed to full-blown trial. In a decision called Hereniac decided out of the Supreme Court in, in early this year, the citation is 2014 um, SCC, I believe, Seven, the Supreme Court of Canada really directed that the courts impose an extremely robust summary judgment rule, i.e. negating, at least in some circumstances, the necessity for what we civil litigators would typically uh, believe is a requirement for a full-blown trial with all of the discovery accoutrements that, that go with it. The philosophy behind that particular decision is that uh, that the administration of justice and the rule of law is brought into disrepute by the invocation of um, onerous and disproportionate um, civil processes. Um, the class actions, and, and that's, so that's, that's the fundamental backdrop. It's the requirement uh, that the Supreme Court of Canada has directed that the courts turn their mind to concepts of proportionality in terms of resolving a dispute resolution process. My, my particular hypothesis is that that philosophy will eventually embed itself into the court-imposed processes for the resolution of individual issues um, in a class actions context. And in Ontario, um, the, set, the relevant section is, and I don't, I don't purport to be an Ontario lawyer, but the relevant uh, provision is section 25 of the Class Proceedings Act. It has parallels in at least all of the other Canadian uh, common law provinces. And, and what that section allows the court to do in re resolving individual issues is to direct that the individual issues be resolved in one of three manners. A hearing presided by a judge of the court. The, the, that's the first. The third is by consent by any process that the parties may agree. But the third is through expert or other person who can conduct an inquiry. The historical definition or, or understanding of the provision in the, the, the last one that I mentioned, which is, the, which, which is the second in the list, is that that regime of an inquiry is limited to matters of account, calculation, simplistic matters. 
um, there is, ex there's, there is um, I think in the, in the context of Hereniac and the direction that the Supreme Court of Canada has given, ample room for creative plaintiff's counsel to begin to ask the court to breathe into that particular provision the use of alternative processes so that in effect there's a, there's a, there's a platform for plaintiff's counsel to say um, bring, drag into the court process a uh, private um, dispute resolution as part of the individual process. The last thing that I'll say, and it's always difficult to prognosticate, um, at least um, do it in a way that ends up being accurate, is if you, want, if, if you want to find solace for why the courts should begin to think about inventing process into that provision, I, again, a pure class actions context. In 2001, the Supreme Court of Canada was very dissatisfied with the absence of class preceding legislation in pr provinces that hadn't brought in legislation. And in Alberta, which had the old representative action rule, um, um, effectively by judicial edict imposed in Alberta uh, class proceedings by uh, breathing life into the representative action rule um, that had been, I'll say this with a certain degree of um, uh, relishness, emasculated by Justice Este in a decision in the 1980s called Nakam versus GM. So anyway, my, my uh, it, it sounds funny from a defendant's perspective to be proselytizing for um, processes that um, may uh, make life easy for plaintiffs, but if you're looking for the future of ADR in class actions built from an historical perspective, um, that is what I would offer Mr. Emblem. And with that, I want to turn it back to you and to Gord to talk at least briefly, you about KPMG and Gordon about um, class um, arbitrations. Well, I know I like to rag the puck, so I'm going to let Gord go first, but uh, I believe this can all be explained by the fact that it was likely the use of ADR in class actions, hyphen, and historical <laughs> perspective. So uh, we've taken <laughs> this and historical perspective. So I'll be cross-examining uh, Janet McKay and Brenda Lesperance later on in, on the uh, <laughs> proofreading. Uh, <laughs> I thought maybe that was because it did not to my undergrad degree or something. No, no. <laughs> so, Gord, why don't you tackle uh, the... Uh, well, th this, is, this has been a long battle in, in the U.S. Supreme Court, and, and the cases are set out <coughs> in, in your material in the last section. It goes back to uh, the Prima Paint decision in 1967 and was finally <coughs> resolved by the Supreme Court in American Express in uh, 2013. But... Uh, it first got attention in Stolt-Nielsen, which I guess it was in 2010, and that was a case where the arbitration clause was silent on whether it permitted class arbitration. And uh, the court ultimately ruled that a party uh, may not be required to submit to class arbitration unless it agreed to do so specifically. Uh, then you go all the way to American Express, and their American Express had a contract that provided that there was arbitration of all disputes, but no right or authority for any dispute to be arbitrated on a class action basis. And it went back and forth, and again, the Supreme Court reversed 5-4 and said the Federal Arbitration Act does not permit a court to invalidate a class arbitration waiver on grounds that the plaintiff's cost of individually arbitrating a federal statutory claim exceeds the possible discovery. So. Uh, you, can, you can refer to it as, as the sanctity of the contract or whatever you want. Of course, that, that court uh, and, and that decision and many other decisions such as uh, Citizens United is uh, a court that uh, stands up for the rights of corporations uh, wherever possible and, and it did in this case as well. So no class action arbitrations unless specifically provided for. So Gord mentioned uh, a nasty <coughs> acronym early MDL, and this conference is not been shy <laughs> or limited on acronyms. MBDL in the United States is multi-district litigation. They've got a system to basically gather in all state commenced uh, lawsuits, proposed class actions, whether it's a, uh, it's not, you know, the first one gets to go. So they've got a system that basically tracks everything that's been started and they will basically corral them all together and they have a panel, a multi-district litigation panel. Then they'll have like lead counsel, it's often you know, New York firms or Chicago firms. And then there will be a role for other counsel in the state courts, maybe a settlement counsel or back 
behind things that you see, they will participate in the fruit of the recovery. So in Canada, we have this constitutional issue, so there's nothing to prevent all sorts of lawsuits from starting right across the, uh, the country, and um, they result in carriage fights where you've got you know, plaintiff lawyer A say, I'm better at this than plaintiff lawyer B, and that still goes on, so it kind of drags the process down. The last five or six years, maybe eight years, there's now some consortiums of friendly uh, firms. You've got a BC firm, the Quebec firm, and an Ontario firm uh, teamed up against another consortium. So there are fewer <coughs> carriage fights, but it still grinds the process down. I think the reason why uh, arbitrators and mediators uh, have a lot more traction and have had in the United States is in the United States, the day of reckoning is largely written in stone. Uh, in Canada, you know, this, this idea of getting your certification motion on within three months of the date the first notice of intent was filed is a joke. I mean, you get to certification like three or four years later after having fights about where you're going to have the fight. And so things drag on. So defendants have much more room to sort of, uh, pardon the expression, screw around <laughs> with the process, whereas in the United States you have a taskmaster, judge, magistrate judge, supervising judge, what have you done, here are the guidelines, and here's what's gonna happen, and here are the deadlines. And uh, there's no, you know, uh, what, judge, I've got something else on, well, you're not gonna be in two places. So as a consequence, they start thinking about settlement a lot earlier. And my first uh, sort of bird's eye view into some of the names of the famous mediators and arbitrators, but largely mediators in the States, were in Canadian proceedings that had a parallel US proceeding uh, recognizing that U.S. lawyers spar a lot more than the friendly Canadians, thinking, you know, well, this case in Canada is never going to settle, and there's all sorts of overlap with the United States, and then all of a sudden, nope, the U.S. case has been settled, and, you know, former judge or retired judge, so-and-so, uh, you know, brokered peace amongst 20 <laughs> How did that ever happen? It's because they've been at it for 25 years, and there's a real, and some of the names are like household names. Um, let me spend five or six minutes just talking about um, ADR, uh, you know, mediation, arbitration, sort of tiered dispute resolution mechanisms, which is a pet peeve of Steve Handel. A lot of people think like, let's just get to arbitration because people aren't going to mediate in good faith. And then the, the, the party that might have to pay for that is, well, why would we commit to, medi to arbitration if there's a possibility of mediating a settlement? So. Uh, leaving that issue to aside, because it'll be debated at these conferences from here to <laughs> eternity, uh, in the one of the early overtime cases in 2007, my client KPMG was hit uh, at the end of August of 2007 with an overtime class action, purported national class on the basis of former employees, uh, sorry, current employees only initially, and the allegation was there was a systemic underpayment of overtime, people either were uh, encouraged not to record their time or had worked overtime and had not been in paid or given time off in lieu. And there was immediately a recognition on KPMG's part, tone from the top, that look, if we're offside, we are going to fix this. So the lawyers, uh, us and, and the <coughs> Pro Crawford Class Action Services uh, and some independent employment firms retained by Crawford with the edict to like make it right, shelved all the preconceived notions about scorching the earth, which you can easily say, well, all of the employment standards legislation across the country says if you've got a beef with your former employer, uh, you take it up with the director of employment standards and you're out of time because they didn't bring that within six months. Well, pursued to its logical consequence, that could result in employment standards complaints in all of the provinces and territories. And do we want that? No, we want to resolve this. So what had happened is Justice Perel was appointed as a class proceedings judge, and unbeknownst to the plaintiff's counsel until the first Tuesday after the very first family day, the defendants uh, with us were swirling away, breathing away, coming up with this thing called the overtime redress plan, which for a time was known as the overtime redraft plan because we kept on giving it to people to cold read and they go, what about this, what about that? And once you get too close to something, 
you do, there's a, a notion to like, you know, what we can improve it. One thing we did recognize as defendant in the class action, we have one chance to get this right. You know, you hear the cliche, you've got one chance to make your first impression. You can't say, oh yeah, no, we'll fix that up. Particularly because we were not announcing this through plaintiff's counsel. And we relaxed the limitation periods. We basically said, okay, well, the period of employ of the single representative class plaintiff goes back to January 1 of 2000. So we weren't gonna say the class period is any shorter than her actual length of employment. So the class period there was when she started work until the end of September of 97, or 2007, and then we said, and we are gonna you know, fix things up or the employer will from October 1, 2007 forward. And there was a hotline <laughs> set up, there were uh, English uh, mailings with 11,000 former employees, current employees, uh, where independently, Crawford had been given in a sort of a titanium briefcase all of the employment records. So the first task was, let's go take a look at the potential claims of those that are in the class. Are, are there any there that have worked and have not been paid? And in the overtime situation, there's eligibility that he's entitled. Not everybody is eligible to be paid overtime. Not everybody that is eligible is entitled. They might be eligible, but they've actually been paid or received time off in lieu. So because there were employees across the country, we thought, well, we have to build in this mediation process. We have to build in an arbitration process. Who knows any mediators in Manitoba? What happens with the employees in the Northwest Territories? David McCutcheon, my partner, says, well, you know, the ADR Institute of Canada, they administer these things. What a great idea. So we got a roster of their roster uh, mediators and their roster arbitrators, and part of their redress plan was if the employees who were sent a determination letter agreed with the first sort of post-claim review of their eligibility entitlement, great. If not, they could go to mediation, paid for by KPMG. We would give them, okay, Manitoba, here is a list of 10 mediators, who do you want? Rank them one to 10. And then the ADR Institute did all the admin work about matching up first choice availability. There were <coughs> probably 40 mediations. There might have been six arbitrations. And the whole process was resolved with Justice Perel certifying on a pre-approval basis the settlement for, or, or, or certifying the case for settlement purposes in April of 2008 with the claim having been started at the end of August of 2007. And the, the, because it was a process settlement as opposed to saying, here is the pot of gold, it was, there is no pot of gold. Whatever you prove that you're entitled to or whatever a mediator and both sides agree to, great, or whatever an arbitrator. So the process was working and the process didn't stop with the commencement of the class proceeding because the claim was not brought on behalf of current employees and KPMG was mindful of its obligations to not only current employees, but also former employees, many of whom are alumni. So there was never any issue of, well, you can't talk to class members or prospective class members. And once things were launched, we were hauled into court uh, by the plaintiff counsel on the Friday after the Tuesday. And, and Justice Perel <laughs> said, why should I stand in the way of people getting money? And, and three lawyers spread out over two firms, plaintiff's side, did not have a good answer to that question. But what they did want to do is kind of change the plan in order to earn a fee. <laughs> and it was, we were saying, if it ain't broke, we don't need to fix it. And so that was like February the 25th. We entered into a settlement agreement March 18th. April the, it might have been maybe April or May, maybe May where we're pre-certifying, you know, judge, this is what we're gonna give to you on certification. We already have a 90% take up rate. The system's working, we're already in the mediations. And by the time we got to like August the 8th, 2008, it, he basically said, you know, this is fine. And he spelled out the factors to take into account when you are certifying for settlement purposes. He 
because there is an issue that, well, there, if both sides want the case to settle, the court's going to take on a bit of a different role because you've got both sides wanting to settle and you've got the plaintiff's counsel wanting to get the balance of their fee. They've got half of it at pre-certification and half on certification. And it, what was comical is in, in terms of trying to justify the earning of the back end of the fee, uh, one of the counsel for the plaintiff kept on referring to one of the very first press releases issued by KPMG that said, you know, as a result of the class action, we've implemented an overtime redress plan. That was us, Judge. Re class action and, and just really, I got it. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Good. Uh, anyway, so that probably involved the potential, well, certainly there were 50 or 60 mediators involved, maybe about 8 to 12 arbitrators. So what I would suggest is cozy up to the class action administrative uh, people like the Crawfords of the world or the um, uh, Laura Brunos of the world because they are dealing with plaintiff counsel, sometimes defendant counsel, in formulating plans at the authorization certification stage. They may not spell out who's going to be involved as a mediator or an arbitrator, but even if they just talk about that generically, you can say, hey, I'm, I'm available. I, you know, I'm, I'm happy to do it. So that was... Uh, Eight, that was five minutes with a multiply. <laughs> 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 so it's 556. Uh, if there's any questions, happy to entertain them. Uh, this session goes till six o'clock. I think uh, you've okay. probably got our email addresses. So if anybody has any questions, That's you right. can email us. Uh, no questions. Observing there's no questions. This panel is adjourned. <laughs> 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 Thank you very much, Mr.